Good morning, everyone, and good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Dhamma Parihasana. Today is day 43. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest today, Professor P.D. Premasiri, Professor Emeritus uh, at University of Peradini, Sri Lanka, who is going to talk to us, share, with, share his insights about uh, how to question, probably questioning the validity veracity and viability of epistemology, which is a big topic in uh, ethics, but from a Buddhist perspective. Let me uh, paraphrase Professor uh, P.D. Premasiri. Uh, he has an extensive uh, bio, but I would like to uh, sum up a little bit because of the time. P.D. Premasiri is an emeritus professor of Pali and Buddhist studies, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. He obtained his Bachelor's of Arts Honours degree in Pali from the University of Peradeniya in 1963 and the Bachelor's of Arts degree in Philosophy from the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom in 1967 and also uh, a Master's of Arts degree from the same university, from the University of Cambridge in 1971. He obtained a PhD from the University of Hawaii in 1980 for comparative philosophy uh, for his uh, work, Moral Evaluation in Early Philosophy from the Perspective of Western Philosophical Analysis. Professor Premasiri served uh, the Department of Philosophy of the University of Peradeniya for 20 years and the Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies for a period of 23 years before his retirement in 2006. Uh, one of the wonderful uh, gentlemen, because it's not easy for someone to work in two departments for a uh, couple decades. And uh, I wanted to look at uh, what happened after his retirement. He retired as a senior professor uh, from the Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies in 2006 at Peradeniya University. And he was conferred uh, the Professor Emeritus in 2007. And uh, before he uh, had his retirement, I think he spent one year research uh, fellowship uh, in, in one of his sabbatical uh, years in Norway, University of Bergen as a visiting professor. And from 1998 to 1999, he was a Fulbright Scholar uh, in residence at uh, Colby College at the Department of, uh, I think, Philosophy. And he worked as a visiting pro professor as well. And he also th taught at the University of, uh, sorry, Washington State University Pullman at the Department of Philosophy in 2004. And in 2007, he also worked as a visiting professor at the Colgate University Hamilton at the Department of Religious Studies. And in 2009, he co-founded and uh, was the director of academic affairs at this new institute called SIBA, uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Buddhist Academy. International Buddhist, In International Buddhist Academy. And in, in 2011, uh, he became the president of the uh, famous Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy after the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi headed to US uh, for his retirement or whatever. And he, he also founded and currently serves as the president of Society for the in, uh, sorry, integration. integration of Science and Human Values, S-I-S-H-V-A. And he is also the president of the SLAPS, Sri Lanka Association for Buddhist Studies. So in my understanding, Professor Premasiri, I could argue, I would argue one of the, one of the deepest, coolest, uh, uh, one of the uh, thought-provoking scholars out there, a leading light in Sri Lanka as well as in the world. Dhamma folks, please join me in welcoming Professor P.D. Premasiri. Professor Vidi Premasiri, how are you doing today? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for accepting yeah. the invitation. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> okay. So we have much to dig into because um, I know that uh, your expertise uh, revolves around the synthesis between the Western philosophy and the Buddhist philosophy, uh, specifically about uh, Buddhist uh, ethics Ethic. as well as uh, language, concepts, reality, epistemology. So, you know, in Western enlightenment and rationality, they kind of, uh, not 100%, but to some extent, they kind of dismiss uh, uh, the Eastern philosophies in a way that they are cute, they are nice, they have aesthetic virtues, but they don't have rigorous thoughts, uh, you know, in, in regard to Western enlightenment. But uh, recently, uh, probably a couple years back, uh, the Professor Robert Wright, I guess, from Yale University, saying that no, uh, Buddhism has radical statement like uh, self does not exist. It's a radical statement. And trying to espouse some statements about Buddhist philosophy in regard to some of the uh, stereotype views of uh, the Western philosophy about uh, Buddhism as well as the Eastern philosophies. But you are someone who is studying the intersection between the synthesis between Western philosophy and uh, Buddhism. So, as we're gonna be talking about epistemology, uh, and it is basically the theory of knowledge, uh, which has primary questions, uh, uh, which go by what is knowledge, where is truth and knowledge found, how does one acquire knowledge, uh, and, and all those things, I wonder how you would explain epistemology uh, you know, uh, in, in general sense. So uh, what is epistemology to you? And how would you uh, view epistemology in your own understanding? Probably you can sort of delineate uh, some of the uh, key elements of epistemology because, you know, uh, we all have knowledge, uh, but we never think that there is something behind our knowledge. So how would you view epistemology uh, in your expert understanding? Yeah, uh, epistemology as a, a kind of approach in philosophy is concerned with the theory of knowledge. That is, uh, uh, it tr attempts to define what knowledge is, uh, what the means of knowledge are, uh, what the scope of knowledge is, uh, how much knowledge uh, as human beings we can acquire, the limits and the means of knowledge. And uh, we find that uh, although Buddhism is not interested in this issue uh, uh, for mere philosophical illumination, uh, Buddhism has dealt with it because it is important uh, for uh, the kind of knowledge that Buddhism is looking for. Actually, Buddhism is looking for knowledge which leads to a certain goal. It's interested uh, in knowledge uh, from a certain practical standpoint. It's not interested in all kinds of knowledge and giving definitions of uh, knowledge in a general sense, but uh, in a kind of goal-directed sense. That is, what kind of knowledge is necessary for us to liberate ourselves from the current predicament of suffering that everyone is going through. So uh, it is with some kind of understanding, insight, knowledge, that it is possible to liberate oneself from what Buddhism called the unsatisfactory state of living. I hope uh, that gives some idea of uh, epistemology in the Buddhist sense. Okay, great. Well, you sort of delineated about what epistemology uh, means to you at the same time, how do you 
uh, you know, generally uh, look at uh, epistemology. You know, some people might be intimidated by the word epistemology, kind of a big word for them, uh, for, for new people. But I know it's, a, it's kind of a fascinating question to ponder. How do we know what we know? I mean, this is a big question too. We make mm -hmm. knowledge claims all the time, every day, on a daily basis. Uh, we are constantly claim uh, claiming to know things, and how do we how do we know these things? So yes. uh, th this is kind of a big question. So and and perhaps if we do not understand theories behind our knowledge, probably what we think could be kind of dangerous too. I mean, on a practical mm -hmm. sense. So on the other hand, we sort of justify we have sort of justified true belief. Uh, for example, I would say in philosophy, uh, they talk about three approaches to truth, kind of three theories to truth. Uh, now probably you may have uh, already uh, paid a lot of attention to these aspects. Correspondence approach, coherence approach, and consensus yeah. approach, yeah. which have three yeah. fundamental, you know, roles uh, under these uh, you know, three main theories, we call them by empirical, analytical, and normative. So uh, you basically uh, shared with us about, uh, you know, sort of the sense of these uh, approaches, but uh, I wonder how would you bring these approaches to uh, Buddhism, because we, we're studying about the intersection as well, and Let's get right into uh, one of the basic suttas because we have to talk about Kalama Sutta because this is our main framework for looking at the epistemology today. Uh, now, with these three main theories, I mean, uh, correspondence approach, coherence approach, and consensus approach, uh, which, ha which have roles like uh, empirical, analytical, normative, how do we look at the Buddhist epistemology. Now, what is exactly the Buddhist epistemology in clear terms? Now, in Sangharava Sutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, I probably think it's the 100th Sutta, Buddha talks about uh, three types of epistemologies as well, uh, Anusavika, uh, Takki, and the experientialist. So how do you see this main intersection of epistemology the, the, the approaches uh, in regard to Buddhist, uh, you know, approach uh, with Sangharava Sutta definition. So uh, I probably think you have a good answer for that. Yes. Now, uh, going back to uh, the Sangharava Sutta, where the Buddha uh, classifies uh, uh, those who want to declare something as true those who want to teach something as uh, the truth that they have discovered, the Buddha classifies uh, these truth seekers into three kinds in the Sangharava Sutta, three classes. The first group, as uh, Bendabal sir mentioned, uh, belongs to the group called Anusavika. And uh, their method was to uh, accept as true on the basis of pure faith and belief what has been transmitted in a long-standing tradition. That is, uh, traditional authority happened to be the basis on which they accepted something to be true. So uh, this is quite common in many religious systems where the authority of a superhuman being or the authority of uh, some authoritative uh, scriptures are considered as uh, the only source through which we can gain knowledge or uh, that we have, uh, they are the sources through which we have access to truth. Uh, but Buddhism considered that uh, Anusava is not a satisfactory means of uh, reaching truth. It may be helpful, but it is not satisfactory. 
So it's not complete in itself because sometimes uh, what is transmitted uh, may have had flaws in the process of transmission itself. It may have been properly transmitted, uh, faithfully transmitted, or there may, might have been lapses in the tradition itself. So that creates a problem in the first instance. Then the second problem is that even if it is properly transmitted, what has been transmitted as uh, truth in a tradition may be in agreement with the reality or it may not. So there is no guarantee that just because something has been transmitted in, uh, in an authoritative tradition, uh, what has been transmitted actually gives us uh, some idea of the nature of reality or truth. So that is the problem with uh, Anusava or uh, what is called revelation or uh, authoritative transmission of doctrines. Then the second one, Thakka, uh, Thakki uh, Vimansi. Now the Buddha says that there are people who just uh, uh, stay in one place they uh, engage in some kind of reflective thinking and then they come out with what they consider to be truths. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's a belief that there is a possibility of uh, getting at the deeper truths, the more profound truths about reality by means of pure thinking. But here, the Buddha points out that uh, if we depend on pure thinking without having any experience whatsoever, it will be just imagination and uh, uh, something that is mentally created, mentally uh, developed. It may or may not agree with the reality outside of ourselves. So the Buddha points out that sometimes, even if something is very well thought out uh, by means of one's uh, uh, rational thought, uh, but has been reasoned out within oneself may or may not agree with the reality outside of ourselves. So reason is also defective. Then the third uh, method of knowing, which the Buddha uh, recognized was uh, knowing by a special cultivation of the mind, uh, by developing certain uh, uh, higher senses, uh, higher sensibility, uh, which can reveal to us uh, even uh, truths that transcend uh, what is open to our ordinary human senses. So Buddhism admits that there is a possibility not only of knowing the reality by means of the ordinary senses, like eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, uh, and also the mind. Uh, but it is also possible to cultivate these senses. Now, for instance, uh, apart from the ordinary sense visual experience, the Buddha speaks of what is called uh, luminous perception or dibba uh, a supernormal kind of vision. Actually, uh, what you get through the supernormal kind of vision is a kind of visual experience, a kind of visual experience which transcends the limits of the ordinary visual capacity. Similarly, one can get uh, a higher kind of uh, auditory knowledge, that is through hearing. Uh, 
So our ordinary sense of hearing is limited. And it is possible by the training of the mind to cultivate this faculty of hearing in such a way that you could hear even more subtle noises that the ordinary ear does not capture. And also you could hear uh, certain sounds that occur at far distant places, which are not open to the ordinary uh, hearing. So these are the two main kinds of uh, supernormal uh, means of knowledge, Dibba uh, Chakku and Dibba Sota. And the, uh, uh, these two are also considered as uh, uh, two forms of uh, knowledge which belong to the three sciences that Buddhism accepts called Te Vijja. They are two of the vijjas, two of the uh, major means of knowing about reality. Yeah. Great. Amazing. Let me get back for a moment to the framework of Kalama Sutta. Probably I need to uh, sort of read uh, uh, the Sutta a little bit to get a sense of what it is. And then yeah. I wanted to ask you about how we can understand these, ep these epistemological aspects uh, and as a framework at the same time, some of the implications, flows that we can see uh, out there in the society. The Sutta is Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, I guess uh, it is mentioned as Kesa Mutti or Kalama Sutta, 3.65, the third section. Mm -hmm. In the Sutta, some of the, uh, I think, Kalamas, the, the kind of people who approach the Buddha, and then they said to the Buddha, Santi Bhante Eke Samana Brahmana Kesa Mutta Chanti. So, uh, some ascetics and Brahmins who come to Kesaputta, they sakangyeva vadang deepenti jyotenti. They they explain and elucidate their doctrines, and parappa vadang pana bumsenti vambhenti paribhavanti omakking karanti. So when it comes to others' doctrines of, uh, I, I would say, uh, teachings, they they get to disparage others' doctrines. Uh, denigrate and deride at the same time denounce and they do the same thing to others as well other ascetics and brahmins and their question is te sang no bhante amha kang ho teva kang ka ho te now with this situation we are very perplexed at the same time we are in doubt kosu nama ime sang bhavatang samana brahmanana satchang aha ko musati bhante as to which of these good ascetics speak truth and which speak falsehood. And the Buddha says, Alang kivo kala man kankitu, alang vichikichitu, kankani yeva pana, vothani vichikicham panna. So it's, it's, dear Kalamas, it is fitting for you to be perplexed and be in doubt. And then the Buddha says this very important piece of the uh, sutta which is really highly uh, relevant to our conversation today. Ether tumhe kalam, kam kalamas, ma anusavel. Do not go by oral tradition. Ma paramparaya, do not go by lineage of teaching. Ma itikiraya, do not go by he, uh, hearsay. Ma pitaka sampadanena, do not go by a collection of scriptures. Ma takkahetu, do not go by logical reasoning. Ma naya hetu, do not go, go by inferential reasoning. Ma akar parivitakena, do not go by reason cogitation or contemplation. Ma ditti nijjana kantia, do not go by the acceptance of a view after pondering it. Ma babharupataya, do not go by the seeming competence of a speaker. Ma samano nugaruti, or do not just go by because you think this ascetic, this monk, this Brahmin is a guru. And then the Buddha says, Yada tumhe kalam, attanam janiyata, 
ಇಮೇ ಧಮ್ಮ ಕುಸಲ ಇಮೇ ಧಮ್ಮ ಸಾವಚ್ಚ ಇಮೇ ಧಮ್ಮ ವಿನ್ಯೂಗರಹಿತ ಇಮೇ ಧಮ್ಮ ಸಮರ್ಥ ಸಮಾಧಿನ್ನ ಅಹಿತಾಯ ದುಃಖಾಯ ಸಂವರ್ತಂತೀತಿ ಅತ ತುಮ್ಮೆ ಕಾಲಾಮ ಪಜಹೆಯ ಬಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಕಾಲಾಮ ಯು ನೋ ಫೋರ್ ಯೋರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಹೋಲ್ಸಮ್ ಅನ್ಹೋಲ್ಸಮ್ ಅಕುಸಲ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಬ್ಲೇಮ್ ವರ್ದಿ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಸೆನ್ಶರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಆಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ಲೀಡ್ ಟು ಹಾರ್ಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಫ್ರಿಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಅಬ್ಯಾಂಡನ್ ದೆನ್ ಓಕೆ ನಾವು ವಿ ಸೋ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಪಿಸ್ಟಮಾಲಜಿಕಲ್ ಆ್ಯಪ್ ಅಪ್ರೋಚಸ್ ಟು ದ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಈಸ್ okay one of the one of the uh, big mistakes that pe- a lot of people have is that people think that all the ways that the buddha mentioned here they are not proper means of seeking the truth but i know that the the reality is they are they are, they are not to be taken that way but they are not sufficient enough to seek the truth but still they are important but i will ask uh, a uh, couple more uh, clarifications from you after that at the same time professor what i understand from the sutta itself is the kalamas were in a difficulty in finding the truth now this is something we all have uh, at this time as well not even the kalamas mm-hmm. now if you take sri lanka if you take other countries if you take the whole world people are struggling to find the truth seeking the truth that's one aspect of the whole sutta second is the buddha buddha's request uh from kalamas to find the truth by yourself truth is not something manifest out there it is you have to come up with your own investigation to find the truth that's the second aspect and the third aspect i see is somewhere at the end of the sutta buddha says we all have to practice the four brahma viharas uh to many directions because we need metta loving kindness karuna compassion uh mudita altruistic joy unselfish joy and upekka equanimity to find the truth because a lot of people they find in the truth with a lot of hate a lot of uh misogyny a lot of discrimination so finding the truth is a big big thing uh, in today's world so my first question at this point is uh how do we understand these epistemological channels or means because when the buddha says do not go by oral tradition it is of course clear that we have an oral tradition if we take sri lanka and we have lineage we have hearsay we have a lot of scriptures we have uh, reasoning uh, logical inferential reasoning uh right so we have a lot of famous uh speakers monks right <laughs> and uh and we also might be impressed by some of the speakers competence of the speeches talks mm-hmm. so we probably in a kind of a dilemma uh to understand these channels so as i said should someone deny all these aspects or should someone consider these aspects to some extent so how does someone understand the journey uh, to find the truth with the epistemological uh, framework that we see in the kalama sutta yes um, one point that i would like to make in this connection is that uh, the kalama sutta is focusing mostly on uh, what we may call discovery of truth uh, that is relevant to our practical life that is uh, relevant to making the proper choices uh, relevant to uh, doing the right thing at the right time that is what the kalam sutra is mostly concerned with so in other words kalam sutra is foc- focusing attention on the discovery of ethical truth moral truth now uh, in uh, the contemporary uh, philosophical circles uh, it is maintained by some uh, philosophers that in ethics and morality we cannot talk about truth uh, 
there is no possibility of uh, discovering truth in this area. Truth is found only uh, on uh, uh, matters of empirical fact. That is uh, what we can observe with our senses. It is only in connection with that that we can find truth. That is, we can find uh, uh, truth about uh, what the shape of the earth is by uh, making empirical observations. But we can't find truth about whether uh, killing is something bad or some other immoral kind of behavior is really immoral. There are no truths uh, in that area, according to this uh, viewpoint. But Buddhism uh, seems to uh, focus more attention on uh, uh, finding truth on these matters, matters related to the good life, living the good life. That is what the Kalama Sutta tries to emphasize very much, that uh, you can determine by finding out yourself what is the right thing to do? What you ought to do on a particular in a particular situation? That is what the Kalama Sutta aims at telling us. But this truth uh, relating to our moral life is not completely divorced from uh, knowledge about matters of fact. Now, Buddhism considers that matters of fact, that is what the reality is, that is to be discovered by means of the senses. So we have to follow the empirical method in order to dis discover what is true about the nature of things. Then after we find out what is true about the nature of things, then we have to apply the standard of morality that Buddhism seems to approve of. The standard of morality that Buddhism approves of is that if something is harmful to yourself, if, it's, if something is going to cause much suffering to the agent of action and the recipient of whatever action you do on the other side, then uh, if it's harmful, it has to be avoided. That is the kind of knowledge that we require in the sphere of morality and ethics. And for this, we have to know the facts as well. And facts have to be known not by mere thinking. Of course, thinking may be necessary in order to uh, find the relationships between the empirical uh, facts that uh, you gather from observation. Uh, so rationality comes in there to see the relationships and uh, avoiding contradictions uh, in your belief system. But basically you have to derive your knowledge from observation and experience and then systematize that the observed data and experience by means of your reason. So reason plays a role in systematizing your uh, empirical or experiential knowledge. So that is how Buddhism would look at this question. Great. And probably uh, uh, it has some ontological aspects as well, while talking yes. about the epistemology. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. The nature of reality is to be uh, known by means of uh, uh, proper procedures adopted regarding methods of gaining knowledge. So uh, we will be misled mm -hmm. into thinking that something is real if we don't follow the proper method of knowing. So uh, it is through a proper method of knowing that we have to arrive at uh, truths about the nature of reality Great. and the uh, truths about the nature of reality can be 
regarding the nature of the external world or the nature of ourselves. Let's sort of look at, uh, uh, I would say, developments of uh, logical aspect uh, in the canon. Now, we know uh, the Abhidhamma Pitaka has a book called Katavattu, which has, uh, I would say, uh, many uh, refutations about uh, you know, wrong views held by other people. At the same time, we see, though it is not the only way of uh, looking the truth, looking, looking for the truth, seeking the truth. Uh, the, the, the the logics uh, have been, you know, the, the logic, the, the subject called logic has been improved, developed by some of the scholarly monks like Vasubandhu mm -hmm. uh, and Dinaga and Dharmakirti. So. Looking at this portion of the epistemology, uh, why do you think that the Buddha rejected pure reasoning? Reasoning is okay, but why he rejected the pure reasoning? And there is another section on the flip side. It is what we understand by atakha mm -hmm. uh, Logic is okay, but the problem is it is not sufficient, as he said. So why? Uh, you know, the Buddha sort of said that Dhamma is not, uh, you know, uh, logic friendly, I would say. It, mm. It's not up to the logic, I mean, in terms of tapping into the higher, deeper level of the Dhamma. So mm. how do you sort of view uh, these two sides? Why this, the scholarly monks uh, develop, uh, you know, logical reasoning part? As a, as a sort of an interesting aspect. At the same time, why we see in the early text that Thakka, I would say, the, the logical component is not, mm -hmm. is not something that can really help someone to tap into the truth. Yes. Uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, Buddhism looked at this question uh, from the perspective that uh, the basic knowledge of the nature of reality has to be obtained by means of observation and experience. There is no other way in which you can uh, gather the uh, sort of raw material of human knowledge. The raw material of human knowledge has to be gathered by means of observation. Now, after gathering that material, it is possible for us to uh, uh, deal with this material in irrational and illogical ways. That is, uh, we can get into logical confusions. Uh, we can get into situations where we don't see the relationships between the facts that we have gathered. And it is in order to avoid that kind of confusion that Buddhism uh, talks about the necessity to establish certain principles of right methods of reasoning. If we don't have a set of principles of proper reasoning, then our reasoning with regard to the material that we have gathered through observation is going to uh, be very confusing. So that is why it is necessary to establish uh, certain principles of sound reasoning in order to avoid contradictions, in order to see that uh, you deal with the material that you have gathered through observation in the proper manner. So uh, the observed facts may be with regard to the inner processes of the mind. It may be with regard to the uh, external reality, the physical world. Uh, whatever it is that we take as the raw material of our knowledge in order to avoid contradictions in our thinking about that knowledge, we have to uh, have certain principles of reasoning established. 
Great. Uh, give us a glimpse of what the Buddha thought about the language, because language is something that you can't uh, sort of uh, disconnect from this conversation. So uh, language in, in, in our understanding is something that uh, we mount arguments, we posit mm -hmm. arguments. At the same time, uh, it can give us a really hard big time to understand the truth. So if if the sort of ideas uh, that we see in language can be ineffable in, in terms of uh, explaining and clarifying. So what do you think, what the Buddha authentically held as uh, his own views about uh, the language? So how do we understand the language? Because now it's a big problem uh, in today's, uh, uh, you know, Dhamma culture, because we listen to Dhamma talks, uh, we read, uh, and we know that Buddha ha did not have uh, this written uh, scriptures at that time. Mm -hmm. And so people might be highly mistaken about, misconceived about the language. So what's the kind, what's the sort of perception, notion sh should we have about the language and what did the Buddha hold about? Yes. And how should we, uh, you know, uh, see the language in the text and how, how, uh, how much uh, is it important for us to read the Dhamma, learn the Dhamma, I mean the language? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, first of all, I must uh, make this point that uh, the Buddha, one of the earliest uh, thinkers who actually was concerned about the philosophy of language. That is, uh, uh, he wanted to uh, show his listeners, his disciples, uh, that uh, language can be very misleading when it is misused. Uh, if you don't understand the role of language, uh, you can uh, abuse language. Uh, so that point was made by the Buddha in his teachings when he said, uh, regarding his use of uh, uh, terms like I, you, me, so and so. Now, these actually uh, involve the subject predicate use of language. Now, we say uh, I existed yesterday. I went to such and such a place and I am here today now talking to you and tomorrow I'll be doing something else. Now on all these three occasions, it is I. So the uh, mistaken assumption can immediately result from this usage of language. And one might think that behind all these actions, there is an I which is immutable, which cannot change. It is the permanent self that a person has. So the use of the subject predicate language uh, brings in this misconception that there is a permanent subject for all actions performed by a particular subject. So the predicates may change but the subject remains the same. This is a misconception due to uh, misunderstanding language. So the Buddha points out, iti ma ko loka samanya, loka panyatyo, loka ohara, loka samutyo. Now, this is the way that we can talk about things. We can communicate to others what we want to communicate only by using subject predicate language to make it intelligible. So that is why I think uh, the Buddha adopted the method that he called Vohara Desana, which is found in the suttas. And uh, it is in the Abhidhamma tradition that there was an attempt made to uh, uh, sort of get rid of the subject predicate form of uh, ordinary discourse and uh, systematize the truths in a certain analytical way. So language 
is a tool and uh, the grammar of language uh, does not uh, offer a parallel, exact parallel to the grammar of nature. The grammar of nature is different. So uh, I think uh, one of the uh, Western philosophers who for the first time uh, understood this was Ludwig Wittgenstein when he said that philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday. <laughs> that is <laughs> when we misunderstand language, when we uh, try to attribute a different role to language, thinking that uh, language represents exactly the nature of reality, then we get misled. So the Buddha very clearly understood that sometimes we can uh, uh, be mistaken about the role of language. Is it because people don't think it's a tool? Do people think language itself is reality? Yeah, people think that language <laughs> is a reflection of the real world. Yeah. Uh, but if you we can consider... Present, yeah, you can represent tool. exactly mm -hmm. as it is the real world through language. Mm -hmm. But it is not possible. Language is merely a tool. It's an instrument. Uh, at the same time, means. yeah. At the, at the same time, uh, somebody might think that uh, you know, when you when you look at the legal studies, uh, especially mm -hmm. kind of a uh, case in in a court, uh, mm -hmm. they always use language. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you are really well versed and if you are really good in uh, arguing, uh, challenging mm -hmm. with your language, probably with the truth. This may help, but it's not sufficient to that higher truth. But still, mm. there is a value with language. Mm. But still, language is a tool when it comes to reality. So what's your piece of, because I understand a lot of people, they struggle not because language is a tool, but because they, they don't form, they don't posit, mount good arguments about uh, mm. the, the, the text and the, the, the Dhamma. We have no argument about the Dhamma, but I mean, when we want to understand Dhamma, if we, because because Buddha says in couple suttas, uh, I want to point out uh, this sutta called Vimansaka Sutta uh, in Majjhimanikaya. The Buddha says that mm -hmm. you have to investigate my Tathagata, uh, my my Buddhahood, mm -hmm. whether I became the Buddha right in right way properly. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can do that, but Buddha still asks us to, you know. To, you know, do an investigation, self-investigation that opens. So the most important yeah. thing is not that yeah. we can check it, but because yeah. Buddha, uh, you know, grants us this openness, this this yeah. freedom to look at it, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I know you sort of like delineated, but uh, what is your piece of thought to people like who need to understand about language and reality without marring their individual roles. Language has a role, reality has a role. How does someone understand these two without marring their specific role? Because it's easy to choose one or the other. Okay, reality, I don't care other things. But how do we tap into reality? How do we understand? We need some tools, right? So what's your piece of advice to balance out uh, these two you know, uh, perspectives? Yeah, as long as uh, we confine the use of language to uh, communicate things effectively, I think it's a very useful tool. And uh, uh, communicating effectively involves uh, seeing clearly the logical re relationships and explaining them in terms of language. So one has to have uh, a clear idea of uh, what a word means and uh, the right context in which a word has to be used and how uh, effectively one can communicate one's idea through language. Uh, I think these matters have been uh, uh, developed to some degree in certain Buddhist texts like the Patisambhida Magga, where 
uh, actually it uh, uh, introduces a Buddhist philosophy of language in those texts. So uh, it is important to establish certain principles regarding the proper use of language, effective use of language uh, in such a way that we don't uh, confuse things through the use of language uh, so that we can introduce something with clarity and uh, with proper delineation of the area which is important for us to understand. So for those purposes, uh, one has to perfect one's language skills. So language skills are very important for the communication of them. Without developing certain skills regarding how to communicate properly, one's understanding of the Dhamma, it would not be possible to bring about some kind of uh, understanding in the other person. So uh, according to Buddhism, uh, uh, there, there are certain levels of understanding, like someone might understand by hearing from another. Parato mm -hmm. uh, That is, uh, uh, there is something called Suttamaya Jnana, the knowledge that you gain, gain by means of hearing. Now, what you hear is what other people speak. So it is necessary for the speaker to use language in an effective and intelligible manner. So language skills need to be developed. Uh, it is only then that one can communicate effectively uh, in such a way that other people, by means of hearing what you say, will be able to penetrate into the truths that you talk about. So uh, the Chanki Sutta, for instance, gives a very comprehensive analysis of this. Uh, when you I was going to ask you about it, actually. In a person, <laughs> yeah. When you gain faith in a person, you approach him and then you sit near him and listen to what he says. And then you have to understand what that person says, analyze it, uh, test it in the light of your own experience. So there is a process of uh, arriving at truth and realizing the truth yourself. Um, let's talk about the importance of personal verification that we see in Chanki Sutta, Kalama Sutta, Vimansaka Sutta, and all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, major uh, suttas about, uh, you know, language, uh, uh, seeking the truth and all that. So why do you think that this, this notion of personal verification is such important? Because I think in today's world, people... They, they sort of like stick to the language and uh, oral transmission more than their own experiential, mm -hmm. empirical level of understanding. Mm -hmm. If there are such, they might come up with some flawed understanding too. I so like, for example, some of the serious meditators, some, some, not everybody, you know, but there are some mm -hmm. abbases like in the logics, you know, head mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So, yeah. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about the importance of personal verification to all out there? Because if we really want to study Dhamma, uh, mm. the verification part plays a major role. Why? Mm. Why is the verification, personal verification, not the verification mm. you want others others uh, to do for you? Uh, mm. Why? Even though you listen to a Dhamma talk, even though you, you read a Dhamma book, uh, mm. if you think that things are ma, things are flowed, the, the main thing is that you find the right people, you find the right books, right mm -hmm. text. At the same time, at the end, this verification part. How mm -hmm. uh, how much is, is is verification, personal verification, important to all of us, uh, not, not even yes. Buddhists? Yes. Now, regarding matters relating to the uh, external 
physical reality verification uh, is uh, not much of a problem that is uh, if someone makes a statement about some material kind of existence applicable to the physical world uh, you can make use of your ordinary senses to verify it and establish whether it is a true statement or a false statement but in the case of uh, the inner reality and now take for instance the descriptions that the buddha has given with regard to the different states of meditative absorption when you say uh, uh, when you describe the first absorption, for instance, in the Buddha's teaching, vivicceva kame, vivicca kusule dhamme, savitakkaṁ savicāraṁ vivekajaṁ pītisukaṁ patamajjhānaṁ upasampajya virati. Now, how does this make sense? Without really uh, verifying it within one's own experience. I think uh, when it comes to the other uh, absorptions, it's even more subtle. The experience is a higher one. Uh, but it should be possible for the practitioner to attempt to see whether these words used in these descriptions uh, stand for something that we can directly experience. I think uh, with regard to the first absorption, uh, there isn't much of a problem. I think uh, most of us can uh, actually experience that. Because when you say vivicceva kamehi, at least during that period in which we are absorbed, we have to forget about our uh, sensuous uh, involvements. We have to withdraw our mind from those sensuous involvements. Vivicceva kame. Then, uh, when we withdraw our mind from those sensuous involvements, there is no occasion for what are called akusalas to arise. So, once you withdraw your mind from the sensuous things, then vivicca akusalehi dhamme, that automatically happens. Uh, these negative ideas do not arise in your mind at least within that period in which you have withdrawn your mind from sensuous things. Then savitakkan savichara that is you have chosen a certain object to focus attention on. It may be your breath, it may be some object outside of yourself. So you focus your attention on that and then you bring that object uh, continuously into your mind and you uh, keep your mind tied up around that object. That is vitakka vichar. Then what you experience then is vivekaja piti sukha. I think most of us can experiment with that. You will feel that very blissful feeling. You will get rid of all the tension that you have gathered by getting involved in various activities throughout the day. If you sit for, say, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, doing this. So that is a kind of verification. I think there are higher levels to which you can go and the Buddha describes them by using terms like abhikkhanta tarang panita tarang. There is uh, an exceedingly uh, uh, more important state to which you can ascend from there uh, and the experience is uh, more pleasant than the experience that you had in the first absorption. So the Buddha invites us to experience within yourself these states that have been 
described by means of language. That language becomes meaningless if we don't actually uh, test them in the light of our own experience. So the experiential part is very important for Buddhism. Uh, now these are the subtle level, but there are other minor things that you can test. Uh, for instance, within the family, the kind of stress that you generate by uh, overreacting to things. Now, according to the Buddha, if you become mindful about your thoughts, your actions, you can avoid a lot of uh, conflicts in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Buddha says, Yani sotani lokasmi satite sangnivarana. That is, there are things that flow into a mind like uh, very strong uh, streams that flow. Sota means a stream that flow with great. Uh, force. So the only way that you can uh, stop them, Nivaran, is establishing your mindfulness. So these are things that we can test in our ordinary life, even within the household situation and in our day to day activities. And I think it is the recognition of this use of the Dhamma that has brought mindfulness into the focus today in uh, many parts of the world. Great. Uh, uh, I like the example you uh, actually brought up uh, to talk about personal verification. That is Sama Samadhi uh, mm -hmm. definition. Sadly, mm -hmm. people don't go as far as Sama Samadhi so that you, they don't get to understand that the mm -hmm. personal verification is such important because they only probably they end up with uh, listening to Dhamma uh, all the mm -hmm. time. But anyways, and, mm -hmm. and you brought up that uh, Vitakka Vichara's, uh, I would say, applied thought and sustained thought, they are mm -hmm. behind the formation of the speech uh, in the mm -hmm. Dhamma. So mm -hmm. if they are suspended or if they are withdrawn at the second mm -hmm. Janic level, mm -hmm. fourth, and then I don't think language uh, mm -hmm. Uh, give us a give us a hindrance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is already it's suspended. No longer right? hindrance. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's it's a good point. Okay. So let's uh, uh, let's move on to the final uh, section of the interview. Now our topic today was questioning the validity, veracity, and viability of epistemology. So, uh, Professor Famousity. Now we know. You know the veracity is a, is a, is a big topic. Like we never know because the texts have been uh, come down in different oral traditions, and how do we validate? How do we see the authenticity? How do we, how do we see the viability of the epistemological framework? We know uh, we can see in the Dhamma. It's a big question. So uh, how how do we think about the veracity of the Buddhist text? Because we know we have these uh, retelling traditions of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, I had a, an interview with uh, a professor here in, in Montreal, Canada, who wrote a book about Yashodhara and the Buddha. And we were mm -hmm. talking about the retelling part of this, uh, this nature. So, and if we go back to the Sri Lankan uh, oral tradition, we know that uh, uh, Buddha Gosha, uh, the monk Buddha Gosha came to Sri Lanka and then he started, uh, you know, sort of, I think, translating the singular commentaries into Pali commentaries, right? Mm. So people might think that he may have lost the originality that uh, had in the singular commentaries and mm. don't know why uh, we lost the singular commentaries. And then because if we had the singular commentaries, we would have learned the Dhamma much, much easier, you know, because mm. it was in singular, whatever the singular bracket or whatever. Uh, we never know. I mean, these all these are kind of like conceptual things. So now we have books. Now we have Dhamma books like Buddha Jayanti and so on and so forth. Uh, and how do we understand the veracity of these texts? Because we know that the textual tradition started in Sri Lanka. So 
uh, you know, how can we bring epistemology to these Buddhist texts, books, texts? How do we now? There are a bunch of translations too. You know, starting from, uh, you know, different Eastern translations at the same time Western translations. So how do we see the veracity of the Buddhist text with epistemology? Who mm. question that? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, the thing is, uh, uh, in an or oral tradition, there is always the possibility of uh, omissions, uh, lapses. Uh, this possibility has to be recognized. And there can be new things introduced into them, interpolations, uh, because they have uh, come to us uh, over so many centuries. Uh, Actually, this uh, came to be uh, raised as a question, even in the tradition, uh, when it was uh, uh, considered under the issue of the four Mahapadesas, the four Mahapadesas, the Buddha himself mentioned of these four Mahapadesas, that is, uh, we uh, uh, accept something because uh, some well-known teacher of the Dhamma has communicated this as the Dhamma uh, that is authentic to us. Then, according to the uh, Sutta, uh, which mentions this, it is said that uh, in under these circumstances, uh, one has to test it by uh, putting it or comparing it with the sutta. Sutte otare tabbani, vinaye sandasse tabbani. One has to see whether it fits it with the suttas and it is, uh, it can be compared with what is found in the vinaya. So the sutta and vinaya are given as uh, the measures, uh, the standards for you to test the veracity of the teachings that have been communicated to you. Now the question is, how do you determine what the suttas are and what the vinaya is? Then a simple explanation is given in the Buddhist tradition itself regarding what is meant by sutta here by sutta is meant the Four Noble Truths. If what is communicated to you is in agreement with the Four Noble Truths, then you can accept it. Mm -hmm. So, katamas means sutte otare tabbani chatusu arya satche. That is the explanation given. Then katamas means vinaye sandasse tabbani with what vinaya should it be compared? It is with raga vinaya, dosa vinaya, and moha vinaya. If something helps you to uh, remove greed, if something helps you to remove hatred, remove delusion, then that is vinaya. So that is how that point is dealt with in the tradition itself. Uh, so I think uh, we can use also modern methods of critical analysis, the his adoption of a historical perspective, uh, trying to uh, identify the mythical elements and filter the core elements from what has been transmitted in the tradition. So we can use all these methods of critical analysis, uh, uh, investigation from uh, critical point of view, historical point of view. Uh, now there are certain uh, uh, sections, whole texts added to the Buddhist canon, which may have been added at a much later time. Like for instance, uh, the Buddha once, uh, the Apadana, the Charya Pitaka, these uh, texts uh, clearly 
represent uh, later developments. The language reveals it. The uh, sort of subject matter reveals it. And and do you think that they defended sort of defended the the sort of uh, the mythological and sort of aspects in the early canon in with those books? Um, do you see any defending nature? Yeah, the actually? element of uh, mythology in the early canonical sources is very uh, little. I think it's not so elaborate. Uh, I think it was a method used at that time by all religious traditions. Mm -hmm. It was a method of communication. What about I the rationality? The East and the West. What about mm -hmm. the rationality uh, that you see uh, in the Nikaya? And, and, and do you think that the later text, uh, the scholars, or whoever the scholarly monks who, who sort of like defended uh, with those texts, uh, like the books that you said, do, do you see such attempts in those books? Um, rationality. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out the rationality part in the Nikaya text. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, there is a lot of material in the Nikaya texts. If you leave out the mythology, the uh, kind of uh, storytelling and all that, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, matters of fact or matters relating to reality expressed in the Nikaya texts. But the emphasis is mainly on uh, matters relating to the human mind, not so much about the material world. So those things we have to uh, uh, critically uh, separate the mythical elements from the real elements. Now take, for instance, a sutta like the Sakkapanya Sutta. Uh, it is introduced uh, through uh, the Sakka episode. Panchasika comes along with Sakka and plays a musical instrument to awaken the Buddha from a, a meditative absorption and then engages in a discussion. Now, that gives a kind of uh, mythical background to the sutta, but the points discussed between the Buddha and Sakta are extremely relevant to our human situation. Mm -hmm. uh, why we quarrel, or why we can't live in peace. Those matters are very much relating to the psychology of people, the social relationships of people. So they are actually uh, uh, the points introduced have a value in terms of social philosophy, in terms of psychology. So those are the core elements that we have to identify in uh, these sources. So uh, the method used was the ancient uh, method of using stories, anecdotes, similes, uh, and so forth. So, great. OK, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are the what are the good ways to study canon and at the same time you know the scriptures? So do you think that we should, we need to study the Buddhist canon uh, more systematically or, or with a good structure? I'm talking about the academic. Uh, mm. let, let let's go into the practitioners. I would say normal Buddhist people, folks out there. At the same time, academics because you are one of the key academ academicians about uh, Buddhism out there. So. If we relate this notion to Alagadupama Sutta in the Majjhima Nikai, the Buddha said that picking, learning the Dhamma from the wrong place uh, is like trying to catch a snake from the tail, which is very dangerous. So I think it's better not to study Dhamma at that point <laughs> mm -hmm. until you find the right teacher and write books. So probably 
this is more you know uh, interesting because people cherry pick buddhist texts right mm -hmm. even the speakers of buddhism some some speakers and some people they cherry pick okay this is what i like i don't know i don't want to know the other texts now mm -hmm. uh, recently i found out someone uh, who said to me in, in in very in a very friendly manner you know what i don't want to read lot of suttas and i this is more than enough for me so i'm not saying that we should study all these suttas uh, in our lifetime uh, you know if people don't have time but uh, what do you think about uh, studying the dhamma both academically and non academically mm -hmm. uh, should we do in a structured way should we just do with whatever the uh, text that we like so we, we for example like someone who likes uh, learning about punya kusala and punya uh, they might like uh, vimana vattu peta i don't want to read other <laughs> much, many, many kind of the yeah. kind, kind of text someone who likes um, the mind yeah so so how, how does that go what is your piece of advice for that yeah. i i think uh, anyone who is interested in uh, getting some familiarity with the core teachings of buddhism the most essential teachings of buddhism uh, or in other words the kernel of it i think they should go to some of the more important uh, discourses found in the first four collections of the sutta pitaka i believe that the most authentic teachings of the buddha are represented mainly in the first four collections of the sutta pitaka and in certain sections of the fifth collection which have the uh, sort of uh, 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 the characteristic of being early texts like for instance now i lay a lot of emphasis on uh, the attaka vagga of the sutta nipata the attaka vagga of the sutta nipata i uh, did a separate uh, discussion of that uh, in uh, a small booklet that i published many years ago called the philosophy of the attakavanga now there are sections like that which uh, are very important in our study and most of them are found uh, i would say uh, it's very important to have familiarity with the first uh, part of the diganika the brahma jala sutta the samanya pala sutta then uh, if you want to have some familiarity with the social issues of the time sona danda uh, ambatt those suttas are very important because they deal mostly with the brahmanical background and the buddha's critique of the existing brahmanical uh, standpoints and how the buddha introduces his new uh, vision into a society in which people were immersed in uh, the brahmanical values that the buddha criticized the brahmanical ontology the brahmanical metaphysics that the buddha wanted to replace by his teaching then uh, majjhima nikaya uh, the first volume contains many many interesting uh, suttas actually i have been assigned the task of doing a fresh translation of uh, the majjhima nikaya volume 1 into english and i am actually involved in that task these days so there are very important uh, suttas i think the best way to have a clear understanding of the buddha's teaching is not to go into the commentary tradition the commentary tradition is right up. yeah this is kind of a probably yeah. controversial i mean do you think uh, should someone not go to the commentary tradition right away or you you kind of suggest people to go later after reading the fundamental text yes yes i think uh, sometimes uh, 
the commentaries may be illuminating in their explanations because they were at least thousand years closer to the original teachings than we are. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we cannot just dismiss the commentarial explanations as uh, having uh, nothing to do with the original teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, they are important. But uh, in that case too, we have to adopt a kind of critical, historical approach when we study the teachings. Um, I think the ordinary believer finds it difficult very often to adopt such a selective approach. Uh, academics can do that. Uh, those who are trained in this kind of uh, historical study can do that. Uh, so it's uh, there is a need to uh, introduce uh, methods of study the Dhamma, a methodology to study the Dhamma and uh, uh, to filter the core teachings from the embellishments, the decorations that you find uh, in the ancient literature with all kinds of myths and legends, stories, uh, anecdotes. So those things uh, one has to be introduced to uh, a method of studying the Dhamma. It is very important. Just not take it literally as uh, a statement of absolute truth. One should not take it that way. I think the Buddha himself never expected people to take what he taught in that way. There is a, a saying, uh, it's in Sanskrit, but it uh, actually conveys the Kalama Sutta message very clearly. You may have heard it before. Tapat chejat nikasacha swarna miva panditai pariksha bhikshavo grahyam madvacho natu gauravat. Which means just as wise people test whether something is gold by cutting it, rubbing it, and heating it, show, so should my teachings be accepted uh, only after testing it in the light of your own experience, but not through just veneration of faith for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, wonderful. So, um, Professor Pemsi, do you have any other thing to add? You may have missed out on uh, in the conversation. Uh, then we can go to the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, nothing in particular. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I would re-emphasize this, that if one wants to understand the core teachings of the Buddha, don't go to the Abhidhamma first. You may go to the Abhidhamma later. That is uh, uh, to see how the later scholastic monks tried to systematize the teaching. Uh, that is also very important. Uh, it's very uh, illuminating, the exercise uh, in which they got involved. But the simple form in which the Buddha tried to convey his uh, enlightenment experience and the body of truths that he discovered, that can be found only uh, embedded in the uh, most authentic suttas of the Pali Canon. And they are found mostly in the first four collections, uh, which have a less mythical approach a less legendary approach, but a more psychological and factual approach. So one has to go into those sections of the Sutta literature 
if one wants to gain a clear understanding of what the Buddha taught. Great, that's a good advice. But still, mm -hmm. we see that when a normal folk uh, listen to a Dhamma talk, the, 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 the speaker does not uh, separate out uh, this is from Abhidhamma, this is from commentary, this is from the, mm -hmm. the, the Pali Nikai right. text. So <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a big problem, you know what I mean? So rather, if uh, the, 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 the listener or reader can have uh, a good amount of Pali knowledge, or I would say mm -hmm. a good translation, a good, mm -hmm. authentic, good translation, mm -hmm. Uh, mm. to, to, to learn the Nikaya text. But it's okay, but you know, this is a good way to say, uh, please uh, try to uh, get a sense of what the Nikaya text say, early Nikaya text, and then mm. gradually move on to the Abhidhamma and the comment commentarial mm. traction. So that's a good way of saying. Uh, yeah, and then I think we sort of uh, touch base and then uh, reflect upon all the aspects of the interview. And we started uh, discussing about what is epistemology and what is Buddhist epistemology and what is Kalama Sutta and why Kalama Sutta's, uh, you know, uh, explanation should should not be taken as, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an utter rejection of all the epistemological aspects uh, uh, instead of mm -hmm thinking that it is it is not a negation of the epistemological tradition, but rather mm -hmm. these aspects, epistemological aspects that we see in Kalama Sutta are not sufficient enough to tap into yeah. reality, but still they are important because still we need some books, still we need monks, still we need uh, uh, rationality, uh, but yeah. we, should not, we should treat them as only tools and not yeah. the reality. And we sort of uh, talked about it, and then we also uh, discuss about uh, some of the other suttas about uh, rationality and epistemology. And we also talked about uh, the veracity of the Buddhist texts uh, and, and the language as well. We should we should always treat these things just to get the knowledge, but not just to attach it to it. And then we finally talked about uh, a systematization of learning of the Dhamma is essential. Otherwise, we're going to be uh, learning Dhamma, which uh, which might not be in a systematic systematic way, so that it will uh, it, it will give, give us a hard time, like you catching a snake from its tail. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is what mm -hmm. we've been talking. So thank you, Professor P. D. Famously, I think I enjoyed yeah, it. I think you might have enjoyed. It's kind of yeah, I, I too enjoyed. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I probably think we could do, uh, uh, you know, uh, an interview also in the future about yeah. another topic yeah. because yeah, you well. are really yeah. focused on language, concept, reality, epistemology, and you have this Western exposure, and mm -hmm. you studied, I guess, under renowned professors and at the University of Hawaii, at the same time Cambridge. So uh, I think you sort of. Uh, you know, bring uh, an infusion of all these scholarly elements and mm. the contemporary will and the scholarship. Thank you very much, Professor Peter Pemis. I welcome. wish you good health and- Thanks for giving me this opportunity to exchange views. You're welcome. <laughs> Dear Dhamma friends, uh, please uh, stay tuned with another episode. Uh, so have a good night, have a good uh, morning here in autumn. Thank you. Okay, good evening.